Of the 861 compositions Karl Czerny published in his lifetime, only 90, or roughly 10%, were made for didactic reasons. Yet today we remember Beethoven's illustrious student and long life friend primarily, if not only through these bundles of exercises and studies. And those memories are not always, let's say, particularly filled with joy. Certainly, if you had the luck of having an old school piano teacher who for weeks would force you to play ever faster and faster, oftentimes, if not always, with the almost sarcastic help of an annoying ticking metronome, I cannot blame you for not really liking that Viennese celebrity. Even though few youngsters will have or are questioning the authority of the teachers, the silent argument in the background that constantly seemed to justify that race to the unreachable heights were, of course, the tempo indications Czerny gave for these works. Even though no one actually cares about those metronome indications, since hey, didn't Czerny gave them to be only distant goals, they are good enough to keep pushing us on that never-ending road to Mount Olympus. <laughs> Instead of focusing on what these etudes originally were meant for, so many aspiring pianists even today are forced to approach these pieces from a purely technical perspective, where the demands never seem to match the physical possibilities of the players. And in case you've never looked into this and still think that might be possible after all with a little bit more effort, I'll give you a few examples that might change that perspective for you forever. Referring to the Opus 299, the School of Philosophy, I have done quite a lot, so I will not stand longer still here than necessary with that opus number, but it's good to be aware of the fact that these 40 etudes require of the student a constant playing speed up to 16 notes a second. Don't feel bad if that feels like totally out of your reach, because you're in good company in this regard. Even a pianist like Lang Lang who hardly can be criticized of being technically inferior, only reaches a tempo of 92 instead of the prescribed 108 in his recent recording for Deutsche Grammophon. For the easiest of the edges of the Opus 299, he should level up his 12 notes a second with 20% to 14.4. That seems doable in numbers, but are in fact 2.5 notes extra each second on top of the 12 he already plays. Adjusting this recording to the actual speed Jenny had in mind, it would sound like this. But the Opus 299 is far from being the most extreme. In his famous daily exercises, Opus 337, the ones that Czerny requires you to repeat 20, 30 or even 40 times, Czerny raises the requirements for far more complex structures to over 18 notes a second, something that is not even serious anymore to be subjected to a discussion to be possible or not. Lang Lang's simple C major etude, adjusted to 18 notes a second, sounds like this. And if that's not enough, in his Opus 740, his Kunst der Fingerfertigkeit, Czerny raises the bar again to 19 and even 20 notes a second. But we're not done yet. In the example Dr. Martin Nordwein gives in the article we discussed in last week's video, Czerny demands 23 notes a second in the etude number 5 of his Opus 365, the Schule des Vitivosen. Here is Lang Lang again, adjusted to 23 notes a second to give you an impression of how fast the notes would go. <laughs> And Nordain did not even give the most extreme examples. In the same bundle, we find ourselves confronted in number 31 with the demand of 27 notes a second. A speed that again goes up to an unbelievable 28 notes a second in etude number 47. 
and that would sound in speed of notes like this. If you would think these examples are the absolute exceptions, I would urge you to do some research yourself. Look also to the studies and pieces with repeated notes. Repetitions up to 15 notes a second are no exception at all. In fact, one can say, but that will be shown in the future video, that of all the etudes Jenny wrote, all the ones that include repeated notes are unplayable on the pianoforte he wrote his music for. The Viennese pianos simply do not allow for repetitions faster than seven, maximum eight notes a second. But even the modern Steinway would be of any help in achieving this. So, can we conclude once and for all that Czerny was not serious about the tempo he gave? That his famous MMs were only targets, stimuli at best, as our teachers kept and keep telling us? Unfortunately, that is not the case. And the more unfortunate, especially in Czerny's case, we are extremely well informed on this. So, for instance, he wrote this in the preface of his famous Opus 299, the Schule der Geläufigkeit or School of Velocity. And I quote, The following pieces are especially tended to unfold this branch of performance, to augment and to preserve it. The only condition is that after you have well exercised them, you play them every day, prior to others, in the marked tempo, observing besides the other rules of nicety and elegancy." End of quote. So not only we have to play these etudes in the indicated time, but also, as in German text is made even more clear than this, mit Beachtung aller übrigen Regeln des schönen und richtigen Vortrags. So it's not enough to spit out the required number of notes only, you must pay attention to expressive playing as well. Something similar we read in his daily exercises, Opus 337, which is, as we've seen, the Opus 299 on steroids, and I quote, On exercera chaque numéro avec tous les répétitions indiquées sans interruption et dans le mouvement du métronome, on se reposera seulement après chaque coda. Or in English, one studies every exercise with all repeats indicated without interruption and in the tempo of the metronome, while resting only after each coda. So it's hard to be clearer than that. And if our teachers said or say to us that these metronome marks were only stimuli, no actual tempi, we just learned that they in fact did not really know what they were talking about. It is understandable, since that's what they have learned themselves, but questionable at the same time, since if one uses his or her authority to pass knowledge to a next generation, one should be sure about a fundamental issue like this before passing it on as a true fact. But let's continue. The fact that the metronomic indication was an exact tempo and not a far distant target is something that Czerny repeated lots of times, and not only for his own works. As for instance in his letters to a young lady, a little book where he explains the basic of piano playing to a virtual student, and I quote, As soon, however, as this is amended, he must endeavor to play through the piece, at first slowly indeed, and then continue to practice it, till he can go through it as quickly as the composer has indicated. End of quote. That tempo that the composer has indicated is nothing else than the metronome marking, as he explains later, and I quote, In the meantime, I beg you to observe in the strictest manner and in the time indicated by the author. Towards effecting this last object, Melzel's metronome will afford you very great assistance in most modern compositions. End of quote. His Pianoforte School Opus 500 leaves no doubt either on the significance of the metronome mark. Let me start by quoting part one first. These few sentences, by the way, should be hanging above the bed of every musician that truly wants to reconstruct the original idea of composers of centuries ago. And I quote, Any musical piece produced its proper effect only when it's played in the exact degree of movement prescribed by its author. And any even inconsiderable deviation from that time, whether as to quickness or slowness, will often totally destroy the sense, the beauty and the intelligibility of the piece." End of quote. 
Again, as in the letters to a young lady, Jenny leaves no doubt what this means, and I quote, The metronome has several ends in view. Firstly, we are enabled by it to find out directly the exact time intended by the composer, and to recur to it again with certainty at any future period. End of quote. Those last words sound no less than prophetic. Since indeed, if it wasn't for those metronome marks, what would we have left today to really make the case for those original intentions of the composer? Anyway, now that we know as a fact that Czerny was not giving metronome numbers as far unreachable targets, but as real tempo indications that he must have felt were perfectly feasible, how exactly did he use his metronome? Let's read together what he had to say about this aspect, and I quote from the same Pianoforte School, Opus 500. Most modern composers now avail themselves of it to indicate the exact degree of movement that they wish for, and the characters for this purpose are placed at the beginning of each piece. When, for example, such an indication occurs as metronome quarter note 112, we must slide the nut attached to the perpendicular rod till it exactly corresponds to the number 112 on the graduated triangular scale. Then leaving the rod free to move, we must play every crotchet exactly with the audible beats of the metronome. In German the last sentence sounds like this. Und spielt jede viertel Note genau nach dem hörbaren Schlägen des Metronoms. So, to me, that seems to be pretty clear. Every quarter note is to be played in alignment with the audible beats or ticks of the metronome, die hörbare Schlage. Or in other words, every single quarter note aligns at least with two ticks. Beats are indeed given in plural, the quarter note in singular. That reads almost as a perfect definition of the whole beat metronome practice, as I believe was the historic use of the metronome. And in case you're new to this, that's the use of the metronome where the individual ticks indicate the subdivision of the note value in the metronome number. I'll link here in the info card and in the description box below a video that will introduce you to this fascinating musical journey. Strictly on a very basic level of grammar, one could say that the plural beats is given in a general understanding. The metronome is ticking, so given constant ticks, and so we play every quarter note according to the ticks. Though that might be a poor description, but still grammatically correct, it can serve as a secondary interpretation only. After all, if that meaning was the one Czerny would have wanted to express, he could have written easily the following. Each quartet must be played exactly with each audible beat of the metronome. That would not only have made more sense, it would have been easy to have given this explanation. But he didn't. Instead, he connected the single quarter note to at least two audible beats. And if his definition could have been clearer from a purely theoretical perspective, for the practical musician of his time, this sentence leaves no doubt to the idea that the ticks define through the subdivision of the note value and the metronome mark, the general tempo. And it solves at once the mystery of the unreachable and quite frankly oftentimes hated journey metronome marks in a way that is surprisingly natural and easy to understand. Why musicians and teachers seem to have forgotten or simply do not want to see this so logical explanation is something we will dive into in the future more. There's still a lot to tell on that, as there is still a lot to be researched. But one thing is sure, even without any theoretical background, what other solution is there to solve the problem of 28 notes per second? Unless you prefer to stick to the story of the broken metronome. But also that story is for another time. So that was it for now. I hope this was helpful. If it was, give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, don't forget to hit the bell as well, and help us continue making these videos for you by becoming a member of our community at patreon.com. Link below and in the description box. Thanks for watching. See you soon again.